Today's program is part of the award-winning series, Profiles in Literature, featuring interviews with persons prominent in American literature for children. The moderator of this series is Dr. Jacqueline Schachter-Weiss. From Leeds in Western Massachusetts comes today's guest, Patricia McLaughlin, an artist with language. Welcome to Profiles in Literature. Thank you. Joining me is my Profiles colleague, Carolyn Field, Coordinator Emeritus of the Office of Work with Children of the Free Library of Philadelphia. Thank you, Jackie. I'm delighted to be here with you and Patty. Before delving into your books, we want to get to know something about you personally. This photo shows your parents. What is their names? Well, my father's name is Theophilus. His brothers were John, Jacob, William, Ted. His sisters were Lillian and Lydia, and he was named Theophilus. I'm not sure why, coming from Russia. My mother's name is Madonna. Oh. So I have come from a family whose names were strange and wonderful. And their last name? Pritzkow. They came from German-Russian extraction. So, Briefly, uh, what did your parents do to promote reading and books with you as an only child? I think they did everything. I didn't write in school because my teachers didn't love my writing. It did oh. not thrill them. But my father had books all over the house and we acted out stories all oh. the time and it made mm -hmm. stories more real than life sometimes. Mm -hmm. And my mother would take me to the library and hold me at the back of my neck uh, on the way home so I could get cross street safely and I'd read the whole time. So they had a Walking great deal. Walking home. Yes. Isn't that yeah. cute? <laughs> Here you are uh, in the backyard, I believe, of your 1793 historical <laughs> home. Who's your companion? That's my dog, Hilly, who, we, who just died, actually. She's been my dog for 18 years. And so she is not only my companion, she is uh, in a new book that I'm doing now about a dog on the prairie. So books come from various sources, and she's one. Does that book, perchance, tie in with your father Yes, also? it does. Yes. You know, books come from uh, our lives so much. And my father taught school in a one-room schoolhouse when he was 19 on the prairie, riding his horse through drifts of snow to start the fire. And I always thought that was wonderful, that all grades were in one school. I thought it was fascinating. And so this book is for him and has a great deal of my dog in it. Ah. That's nice. <laughs> Twofold. You said about your dog and Sarah Plain and Tall that she snored with a high whistle. <laughs> That's right. right. Like a tea kettle. I yeah. turned her into a character, which is what we mm -hmm. writers often do. I think it's the only way to save your save the souls that you want to is I know Maury Sendak put his dog in a book and often. so I have too. Mm -hmm. Often. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And this <clears throat> snapshot is taken in your living room <laughs> and it shows a number of your companions That's with you. True. Who are they? That's true. Well, the ones that are still, this is my writer's group. We meet once a week um, uh, and very kindly and gently criticize each other's writing. Mm -hmm. You have to be careful and we're all writers. Uh, next to me is Ann Turner who wrote Dakota Dugout and next to her is Shalamath Oppenheim who wrote The Selkie Seed and Jane Yolen is next who has hundreds of books and who mm -hmm. began this uh, group years ago. And on the far end is Dale Cope who wrote The Scarecrow book. So we, this is mm -hmm. one bunch of writers in oh, one place and we're all splendid. getting along as you notice in the picture. Splendid. <laughs> uh, we now see a view of your Cape Cod summer home and next to that is the family group uh, on an outing on the beach. Can you tell us who uh, is included in your immediate family and what their occupations yes, are. Yes, in my family, well, my husband is a psychologist and he is my first reader and uh, he's a very good reader. And the rest of my children, John is the oldest and he is a photographer, a freelance photographer and a writer. Jamie is a journalism major in college and Emily is just now starting college and heaven knows what she's going to do. And that's our family. And your, the final view we have yes. is of the prairie. Um, that was the setting for your most famous book, 
Sarah Plain and Tall. Mm -hmm. Is this in Wyoming or North Dakota? Well, this picture, uh, picture that you see is really in North Dakota. It's my father's farm, um, where 2,500 acres is just a small farm there. Oh and my. so, but my mother grew up in Kansas, and um, I grew up in Wyoming, so that the prairie and Sarah Plain and Tall really is all three of these put together. It's the best thing about being a writer, you know, is you can do that, compress life. <laughs> So actually, uh, your whole family were prairie people, yes, and we you had the right background. Yes. Well, what ever brought you to the East? Well, my father, being a school teacher, came to teach at the University of Connecticut, and I was still in elementary school then, and so I became an Easterner, although I still miss very much the wide open spaces, and every time I go back there, I feel like I'm home. Mm -hmm. It's funny how what we know best stays with us. So. When you're young, when you're young. Yeah. Well, we're glad that you came east so that <laughs> we can celebrate on this program. Uh, Sarah Plain and Tall, mm -hmm. which won the uh, Newberry Medal in 1986 yes. from the American Library Association. Yes. It, it's a, briefly a story about a mail order bride from Maine who marries a widower on the prairie That's who true. has two children. And I understand that Sarah's based on a real person. Now, where did you yes. get this information? In my mother's family, you know, in those days they lived in great extended families in one house, which I think is wonderful. Children nowadays lose track of grandparents and aunts and uncles a great deal. But this woman came from Maine to be a wife and mother to an uncle, and my mother loved her first. Oh. And so I thought, what a brave and risky thing to do, to travel all that way. And so that's where the story came from. Well, why was it important? for you to tap your mother's memory about this time? Well, about this time, my mother, when I decided to write the story, she was uh, losing her memory to Alzheimer's disease. And I think the reason we write is to confront problems we have sometimes. Robert Penn Warren said we write to solve problems or answer questions. And in a way, I was losing my mother. And it's a book so much about a family and a mother coming to some uh, mm -hmm. family that I, I wanted to write the story and I wanted to save a little bit of my mother's past for her. So you really were writing for your mother. Yeah, yeah. really. What, what would you say was the primary theme of your book? Well, I often don't know until I'm finished and the book is out and I look at it and I say, oh, oh. that's what it is. It seems to me to be about family, how a family comes to be, even though they are not always blood relatives. I find I have family members that I feel are family members among friends. And oh, so yes. I think that's mm -hmm. really what the story is about. What is your favorite sentence in Sarah? I think my favorite sentence is the one that says, uh, the color of the sea was a color for which there is no name. And as a writer, I often feel that words are not enough. We cannot hold a world in words, and there, there are spaces and moments in between. So that's close to what I feel about writing. I see why well, Sarah is <laughs> certainly a short powerful book. And how many yeah. pages is it? I don't know. 58? I don't That's, know it's now. It's, it's because I'm writing a movie now. It's very close to me how long the movie, how long the book is or how short it is, actually. Ah, so you're yeah. doing a movie on it. I'm mm -hmm. doing a movie on it for Hallmark Hall of Fame, and it's a two-hour movie, so unless everybody speaks very slowly, I have to rewrite this story yet again. I was going uh, to say, and more because from an it is when short. It is short. And brief. Yeah. And I remember when you gave your uh, acceptance speech yes. for the Newberry, you said that you did uh, hope that your acceptance speech would not be any longer than the book. For which the award <laughs> which was it, given, I right. know. <laughs> so, right. uh, uh, teachers uh, and librarians do like these short books for older children because uh, the first question that a reluctant reader asks is, how many pages? I know, that's true. So, and yeah. so from this you're making a two-hour movie. Yeah. That's something yeah. to be looking forward yes. to, isn't yes. it? Yes. Yeah. Uh, you began, though, to publish seven years before you did Sarah. Yes. What was your first book? Well, you know, my first book actually was not published. Oh, um, really? I'd got well, my share yes. of rejections, and the mailman and I knew oh, each other very I well. Didn't. And he would know if it was a little package, it was right. something good. If it was a big one, I was getting my whole manuscript back. Um, but the first one published was A Sick Day, and it was about my husband and our our child Emily and it was a kind of personal book and I thought well this is what I'm gonna write about from now on and it worked and they were embarrassed when it was published and I said don't worry I'll never tell anybody that's about you two ever <laughs> oh, good. you've lived up to your right. word <laughs> well it was lo uh, beautiful illustrations by R William Penn Dubois that's true and how did you get Pantheon to publish it 
Well, I don't know. They they felt it, it struck a chord somewhere in them, and they liked it, and so I sold that, and then Moon Stars, Frogs, and mm -hmm. Friends, uh, almost in the same week. So really? After my year of rejections and homework, yeah. um, there I was. And that doesn't mean that I sell every book, of course, that I, I sure submit. Yeah. Uh, we still have rejections, and sometimes it's best we not publish a book. But why did you then move to Harper after you had the two books at Pantheon, or is this embarrassing? No, it isn't embarrassing. Yeah. Charlotte Salatow and I became, uh, we, we liked the same kind of books, and my agent then said, I thought, I think she will love your next book, which was Through Grandpa's Eyes. Uh -huh. It had a certain quality of the old and the young together, which Charlotte and I believe they have something in common. So Charlotte and I became very good friends, and she's been my editor ever since. The uh, book, Through Grandpa's Eyes, is in a basal reader in my building. It's uh, the story of a boy who sees uh, what it is to be in a blind world, the blind world of his grandfather. What gave you the idea for a piece of thinking wood? Well, I'm looking back at that book and remembering when I started it. Um, I started it in response to my father telling me he was going to sell his house and move by the ocean. And I thought that was wonderful, and I thought that was my house. So I was very personally involved, and I couldn't ask him not to sell it. So that story grew out of that. And I think what it's about is the people in the house, not just the house. And the wood was something that someone non-sighted could touch and feel. Mm -hmm. It's almost kind of like a river, the wood. And I have a piece at home. That I save. Well, it's one of my favorite books Thank because you. I have worked for, with the blind yes. and physically handicapped. And you know that Deborah uh, Cogan Ray is yes. a Philadelphian. I know she is. Now, have you met her? I have or met her, you yes. Have, she's uh -huh. the Do you ever meet with your uh, Not usually. We don't usually meet beforehand, and I think that's the editors very wisely not wanting the writer to impose his or her views on the illustrator. So most often, a book comes to me, it's like you, you write a book and it's like having a baby sending it away for a year or two and it comes back with hair coloring and right. faces mm -hmm. and it's a wonderful surprise and books have a life of their own. Mm -hmm. It may not be the image that you had in your mind when you set out to write the book, but it somehow works and I'm very fond of the illustrations in that book. Well, I think they're beautiful yeah. too. Yeah. And uh, Mama One and Mama Two is yeah. another very uh, sensitive book this story about the mm -hmm. little girl whose mother is mentally ill mm -hmm. and how the little girl and her foster mama get together yes. and so on. Well, now, did this uh, uh, come out of your work with the uh, Family Service Agency? Yes, it did, and I didn't know it. Um, until a year after the book. I, I looked oh. back and thought, oh my gosh, I did do a series of articles for a newspaper on foster mothers. They always struck me as a breed unto themselves. Mm -hmm. They were wonderful, the love that they brought to young children. Then the young children would go off and leave them and become adopted. Mm -hmm. um, but I knew a woman when I was a very small child, when I was not going to be a writer, I was going to be a gorgeous movie actress or something much easier than being a writer. And she, her little boy who came to live with her called her mama too. Mm -hmm. So that came from way back in my childhood, mm -hmm. and that was the hardest book I ever had to write. People think writing novels takes a longer time and a harder. The picture books are by far the hardest mm -hmm. because they're so bare-boned and you have to get so much. One little boy said to me, you have to squish all your thinking into, into one, one, and he was right, of course. Another of your picture books is Seven Kisses in a Row. Here, seven-year-old Emma's parents are away at an eyeball doctor's convention. She has to adjust to her sitters, an aunt and uncle, and she teaches them to give her seven wake-up kisses in a row. What do you think is the primary theme of this story? Well, this book came very much from my children, who taught me a whole lot, and I think that it really is what children know. They know a great deal about being parenting and being nurturers, and they teach this couple who are older how to be parents. And I think empowering of children is one of the things I try to do in my books. No, I think also this book uh, uh, emphasizes accepting people as they really are and not trying to make them over, which I think is good. Well, you know, I had yeah. parents who really uh, accepted diversity and had a great deal of tolerance for eccentricity, so I do have a lot of tolerance for people's differences. Your first longer story was author for the very first time, right? Uh, which uh, was a children's notable book in 1980. Here, 10-year-old author spends the summer with his great aunt and great uncle. 
he changes so much that his friend Mora ceases to address him as Mouse and calls him Arthur for the very first mm -hmm. time. Does your father, who uh, was li who might like uh, Arthur's great uncle, mm -hmm. be a gardener? Does he still plant rows of onions and roses <laughs> in the same garden? You know, yeah. I didn't know that was my father in the book until Jane Yellen pointed it out yeah. to me. She met him. I thought that was an uh, uncle and an aunt. Both of them were uh -huh. ones I would like to have, but they are clearly my parents, and my father did have a garden of onions and roses. I never thought to ask him why. Uh, he liked, I think, the difference in how the onions were tall like sentries, you know. Mm -hmm. But uh, there's a good deal of me, my family, and the place where I live in that book. In uh, Author, you show Aunt Meg. Yes. The first time you show a mail order bride. Who gave you the idea to expand that character into her own book, Sarah Plain and Tall? Yeah, actually, m many of my books begin in the books before. It's like a little thread of a life going on. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was my agent, Craig Verdon, said to me, you know, that's a wonderful story there. That would be a wonderful story into itself if you ever want to do this. And he was absolutely right. And I think sometimes those stories are all in us, but we need somebody who's very objective to let us know that that's worthwhile. Every time I'm in the middle of a book, I think, oh, this is so dull and boring. And my husband has to sit down and say, this is very worthwhile, and here's why. So we lose perspective when we're very close to it. So Craig pointed that out to me, mm -hmm. and then when it was time, I wrote Sarah Plain and Tall. Uh, Unplaying Treasures, yes. which has won uh, several awards, the Boston Globe Horn Book on a Book, yes. and Horn Book Fanfare, and yes. so on, um, which is a delightful story. I, and I understand that the title came from a phrase that your mother used yes. for single women. Or men. Or men? Yes. Oh, I, Older I or single, that. unmarried men or women no, were unclaimed remember. treasures, yeah. yes. Or why, do you, why, do you, why is this so apt uh, <laughs> title for this book? Well, this book to me was about actually being nobody's really claimed. Uh, you can That's be right. married or not married, and you are your own person. Mm -hmm. And so this book is kind of attached to my mother about this, and it came from my life. When I was a child, I fell in love with the man next door, and oh, just like yeah. the child in the book. Mm -hmm. And so it's very close to me. And, you know, um, my mother said, you should be in love with him. He's very good to his yeah. wife and children. And what she was telling me was he was a good model. And as very it was, good. I grew up and married a man who was very kind to his wife and children. Uh. <laughs> Your a novel, Cassie Binniger, yes. uh, shows uh, an intermediate grade child who's a little bit ashamed of her non-conventional family. <laughs> she wants to be a writer, so she hides under a long tablecloth with a pad and pencil, uh, taking notes. Yes. And uh, she waits there while family members gather in the dining room. You've stated in uh, Cassie Binniger that while she recognized the voices, it was the feet she came to know, as though each person were turned upside down for her. Is Cassie autobiographical? Yes, and I didn't know it until I oh, really? sent the yeah. manuscript to my mother. And in the return mail came a package, and I opened it up, and there was this tablecloth. My mother knew I was under there all the time, listening to all the private conversations that went on. So yes, that was me. I probably was ashamed of my family because they were quite quirky and individual. And you go mm -hmm. through a period, you know, of looking at your parents and saying, "I wish they didn't wear those funny clothes," or "I wish." my mother didn't have that hat but my daughter once said to me are you gonna wear that and I thought oh it's my childhood coming to haunt me you know there is a commonality of children wishing their parents would be different so that certainly was me well, and you, you use that a lot because your latest book, The uh, Fact and Fictions <laughs> of Minna Pratt, is also a story of an um, un uh, unconventional family. And uh, I, I just love it when uh, Minna says to her family, we're having Lucas for dinner, and they both say together, we hope he's plump and plump tender. And tender <laughs> yeah. Which embarrasses her to death. That's right. This comes from my family. I wrote this book at a time. I started it when my daughter and I were not getting along. We were mm -hmm. clashing. She was 15 and my husband, the psychologist, said to me once, you act like you're 15 also. So I started this book, and soon after we became good friends, my daughter and I, and we are to this day. But it is a good deal about our mm -hmm. family life, certainly. And I play the cello, so the music part comes from me uh, as well. Well, that's, I was 
wondering if, uh, I, I, as a cellist, if you're still looking for your vibrato. I have my vibrato you have your now. Vibrato. Oh my. Yes, but I used to play in a school orchestra as an adult. They made me go in the back row because the boys all played so fast. They figured that was the point to get to the end of the piece first. Sure. So I would sit mm -hmm. there and step on their toes while I was playing to slow them down. <laughs> As much as you enjoy mm -hmm. writing, you seem to be equally enthusiastic about teaching, yes. as this mm -hmm. photo shows. Uh, here you are instructing a group yeah. of adults. As a visiting lecturer in children's literature at Smith College, what are some of the tasks you require of your students? Well, what I do is have them um, develop an eye and an ear for children's books. They aren't sure yet um, that books shouldn't just teach lessons all the time. And one of the great joys is for me to help them, help them see that story is the first important thing. Uh, they have to write critical papers, and they ought to do, also have to do some writing of their own. For instance, to begin a picture book, I never had them finish one because it's not a writing course, but they begin to see how very special a picture book structure is mm -hmm. and how many leveled it has to be. It has to appeal to the adult as well as to the child. So I demand a great deal from them. Oh, you are tough, <laughs> but exciting. <laughs> and as busy as you are, you still find time to visit schools and libraries, as this photo shows. Why is it important to you to inspire young people as future writers? Well, I'm not sure that I want to inspire them so much as to let them know that writing for me is just as difficult and joyful oh. as it is for them. I show them my many drafts of things. Mm -hmm. I think they think writers get it right the first time. So I show them my drafts, I show them what doesn't work, and I think that if they see that we have a good deal in common, it makes books and writing more accessible for mm -hmm. them. How old were you when you started writing? I was old, as my children said. I was 30-something. <laughs> yeah, it is a little right, old. Right, that was old, some, yeah. Some yeah. And I wasn't a writer when I was young. Um, I think I had many imaginary characters who lived with me, however. I had great long conversations with them. So that when I begin a book, I begin with a character now. Well, did you ever see an author when you were young? No, I that thought made they, a difference. No, I thought they were either dead, brilliant, or both, yeah. and had all the answers, you know. So, uh, <laughs> so I think that helps children to see that I am a normal human being who has children and who may lose her temper from time to time and tell her children she's sorry and has pets and so on. Mm -hmm. You begin the process of writing a story with the characters. Yes, said. I do, always. I begin not knowing how a story is going to end. I'm a participant, and so mm -hmm. I begin with a character and slowly go through the chapters, getting to know this character with the reader in a way, and that's the only way I seem to be able to write. Mm -hmm. When do you know the plot? Oh, that horrible plot is always my hardest point. I always tell, told my, my uh, editors I was sick on the day they taught plot. Um, <laughs> when I get to the middle of a book, I see how it may end, and I'm not quite sure how it's going to happen. So it's different for different books. Mm -hmm. How do you work with your editor? I work very well with my editor. I really Charles, respect Charlotte yeah, Zolotow beautiful. very much. She's taught me a great deal about writing and about teaching in the way she criticizes my work. She will ask mm -hmm. questions that elicits for me my way of doing it. And what she tells me is I have the power to do this, to revise. Mm -hmm. So we work very well together. So she really inspires you and backs you up. Absolutely, absolutely. Right. And what she does is um, reassure me that each book is my own, that mm -hmm. she's the editor, mm -hmm. but it's not her hand on it, it's mine. Well, that's good. Yes. Uh, do you do, have to do much research? I do some research. When I wrote Sarah Plain and Tall, I had to make sure that the right flowers were blooming mm -hmm. at, on, the, on the prairie at the right time. Uh, and I travel a good deal. And I carry around with me in my pocketbook at all times a little bag of prairie dirt with sagebrush in it to remind uh -huh. me what I learned about writing Sarah, which was that the place is a character every, ever so much mm -hmm. important as the people. You get a lot of uh, letters, I imagine, from I children, do. and particularly since you, you won the Newberry, is that I right? I do. Yes, I do. Uh, do you get some funny letters? I get wonderful funny letter. com comments. I get letters that say, um, I wanted to write to Beatrix Potter and Mark Twain, but they're dead, so I'm writing to you. Ah. How are you feeling? <laughs> Things like that, oh, yes. And I try it. to answer them, although there's uh -huh. a big backlog, and so I'm uh -huh. six months behind. 
Oh, yeah. my goodness. <laughs> w w tell me a little bit about your writing habits. What time do you, day do you write and what do you use? Okay. And well, I used to get up first thing in the morning and write because I thought I was brilliant at six in the morning, and oh. I still tend to do that. Though uh, the older I get, the more books I write, the less I think I have to say, so that I write kind of in peaks and valleys like this now. I don't work steadily every day as I used to. Mm -hmm. Well, would you use typewriter? I or? use a typewriter. I have a computer now, which I'm learning to use. If I had a gun, I might shoot it, uh, because it, uh, it's I'm not a user-friendly person yet, but I may become one. I don't mm -hmm. know. But I prefer the typewriter. I like the sound of it, and I like the carriage going by and all that. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Our guest today, a former English teacher, Patricia McLaughlin, is a master at her craft. She writes briefly, often humorously. In both fantasy and realistic fiction, she makes each word count. While she depicts unique characters, she emphasizes relationships and acceptance of others. Her Sarah Plain and Tall won both the Newbery Medal and the Scott O'Dell Historical Fiction Award. On the day that she received news that she was going to win the Newbery, she had luncheon and her fortune cookie contained <laughs> this message, you will soon be recognized. A child tells why she is recognized. The child wrote, you take facts and then you reach. Long may you continue reaching. Thank you. <laughs> it's a pleasure having you here. Thank you. It's nice to